What's up everyone, it's Kenji here and today I'm joined by my good friend Matthias who's an investment banker in New York with experience at Goldman and Bank of America and he's been kind enough to share with us some of his insights on the role. So firstly, we'll go over the recruiting side, looking at all of the application aspects, the interview, and then we'll move on to the day-to-day, -day, what the job is actually like, and finally, we'll get to some of the key skills you need for the job. So let's get into it. So Matthias, just starting with the basics, can you tell us a bit about your background? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I grew up in California, didn't really have much experience uh, in the whole banking space until I made it out to the East Coast for college. I spent my first year at NYU studying business there with a focus on, on finance as well, um, but made a switch over to Cornell, same time you did, um, and studied applied economics and management there, which is uh, Cornell's equivalent of a business degree. And how, how did you get to your bank, banking job? Did you do previous internships before that? Yeah, so it was one of those things where, you know, my family didn't have background in the space. I was kind of going into it with a with a blind eye. And so I spent a couple summers just trying to explore different opportunities in finance to see what, what was right for me. Um, my freshman year, I was at the Fox Networks group back in Los Angeles, focused more on the FP&A side of, of finance. Um, sophomore year made kind of a switch towards my current type of role where I was at a, a smaller private equity firm in New York, uh, where one of the Cornell um, had, had been nice enough to let me intern for the summer. And that got me good exposure heading into to my summer internship where uh, I was with Goldman in the structured finance group. And for, for that structured finance group internship, did you have to do any kind of networking? I know it's a big thing in finance. Yeah, yeah. Networking networking's a huge thing in finance. Um, so there, there's, there's a whole process to it. You know, I think from a more structured perspective, when banks would come onto campus, um, definitely take advantage of those opportunities and go to the networking events. But you know, beyond that, I think it, it's it was critical, at least in my recruitment process, that I I be a little bit proactive about reaching out to people and getting getting my face in front of others. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we did is is cold call and cold email a lot of people. Um, LinkedIn is your friend for sure, and you just uh, find yourself on there a lot, just trying to see if there are school uh, alum at at certain banks, reaching out to those contacts first because they're probably the most likely to respond back. But uh, if not, just reaching out to whoever I could and whoever I could find the contact information for. And suppose, you know, you get past that stage, you send the application and what, what's the interview process like at a bank like Goldman? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for for summer analyst positions, which is really kind of the, the segue to a full time position, right. um, they do have a very structured interview process. It, it's fairly consistent across banks, I would say. Um, obviously the first is just to submit your resume and that's, that's a huge vetting process on its own. But once you get past that, there's usually, um, what they call like a phone screen or a higher view interview, um, for some larger banks that just don't have capacity to, to phone call every single person that, that, uh, applies for the position. And so you'll do like a, an initial interview will, where it'll mostly be behavioral questions, just asking you about, you know, your background, why you're interested in the role, why you're interested in the company, and then kind of transitioning after that. Uh, you get invited to something called a super day, uh, which is typically a three or four interviews where you go into the to the bank's headquarter uh, in New York City or wherever location that you're applying for, and you speak to to two reps per interview round, typically twenty to thirty minutes, depending on the bank, um, and you do those consecutively. And uh, following that, you hear within a couple of days of of uh, whether or not you got the job offer. Nice. And just going back to the networking side, like where does that come into the picture is that at the application or, or just after in the higher view or yeah i mean the, the the cold calling the cold emailing it's it's a little bit of both um i would say it the principal focus is probably beforehand okay you definitely want to have exposure before you submit your application you know at the end of the day it's somebody who's on the other side of it picking applications out and um it comes to maybe if they even recall your name when they're looking okay. through the resumes you know, they might see you're qualified as well, but if it's something that pops out to them, maybe somebody that they've heard that has been speaking to people on your team, um, it'll just increase your likelihood of being able to to be selected. And so I definitely think it's something that, you know, we focused on before um, the interview process began. And in terms of, you know, actual skills that you need um, for, for that interview and potentially for that internship, 
Uh, are there any courses in university that you'd recommend taking? Yeah, I mean, for sure, 100%, I think the most important class is is accounting. You know, it's it's I, it's it's an understated class, and I I don't think it's um, necessarily the most dynamic, but um, it, it's one of those things where you learn the the foundational skills that you need to for this job. I don't think without accounting, you are able to do the day to day tasks that you're required to, and it honestly does serve as the foundation for almost everything we do in finance. Right. And so from that perspective, I think that that was definitely the most important class I took altogether in college. Um, you know, uh, that's not to say that you need to go to a program in college that offers a business program or where there's accounting, uh, classes that, that are offered. I think one of the things with this job, especially with the way that it's structured in recruitment cycles is that you'll end up having to self-teach yourself a lot of it just right. because you, you know, maybe at the time you haven't taken up a level finance classes or whatnot. Um, and so external third party resources of, are probably the best best resource for you. And speaking of finance courses out there, if you're looking to land a job in investment banking, FP&A, or any finance related department, you can check out our finance evaluation course where an investment banker, a financial analyst, and myself teach everything we know about finance, valuation, and financial modeling on Excel. First, we cover financial statement analysis using Apple's real annual report as an example. Then we get into financial modeling through a three statement model. After that, we begin the valuation phase where you learn to do a discounted cash flow, a comparable company's valuation, and a present transactions valuation on Adobe, looking at the real financial statements to eventually derive a valuation range. Lastly, we'll show you how to present an investment thesis using a stock pitch format. So if you're interested in checking it out, go to the link in the description below. All right, so moving on to more of the day-to-day -day and what that's actually like. First of all, can you explain what an investment banker actually does? Because I feel like a lot of people don't really understand that. <laughs> yeah, um, it definitely depends, I think, on the role you have within investment banking. You know, banking is largely bifurcated into two different areas. One, the capital markets and one more advisory. Um, they might be called different things at different banks, but largely those are always the two splits. On the capital market side, you know, your your essential function is to help execute capital markets transactions, just meaning that you're helping to issue securities for clients, whether that be some type of bond, some type of loan. Uh, if you're working on IPO, you're issuing stock. I um, mean, so your your job is definitely focused on the market side of things. You know, you're helping to do things to to get to execution of that transaction. And so, you know, whether that's keeping up to date with the markets so that you can get the best pricing for your client, be most informed at what what is just happening in the general environment, um, putting together, you know, types of market updates for your team or for external clients, whether that's putting together, you know, internal committee memos for for getting these transactions approved and for your bank's role in the transaction um, or coordinating with different parties along the process with investors with legal counsel and those are kind of things that i would say largely you do on the capital market side of things on the advisory or, or more corporate finance oriented side of things um, where you're kind of siloed into different industries you do a lot of work in in powerpoint and excel i think that's kind of the, the reputation of the job but it, it would surprise you you know i think i think one of the things uh, a lot of a lot of people think about when they go in is that you're just going to be you know, turning an Excel day. Right. And it, it is quite surprising how much time you actually spend in PowerPoint. I think okay. that's probably actually the more predominant thing. It, it's it's just a matter of the types of presentations you're putting together in banking. You know, it, it's one of those things where you're using PowerPoint for everything, right? Whether you're you're baking off for a deal, just meaning you're trying to win the, win a pitch, win a mandate, or you're putting committee memos together or different types of transaction related documents. So for debt, if, if, for debt issuances, it, it could be something like a, like a ratings agency presentation where you go to you know S and P or Fitch and try to get a, a certain Reddit rating on a on a on a credit. Right. Or if you're working on an IPO, if you're working on you know an analyst day presentation or an investor presentation when you're going out to market, um, 
or for like an M&A process if you're putting together a SIM or a confidential information memorandum. Like these are all things that are very PowerPoint based and it's, it's, it's um, just putting together essentially for the most part uh, a profile of the business. So a lot of it is PowerPoint. Excel, of course, is, is, another, is another thing that you have to know um, from a valuation perspective, but also just general models, operating models and, and understanding um, the mechanics of Excel is something that's pretty pretty crucial to the job. Understanding data is, is something that's pretty important. Um, and then beyond that, I think it's it's surprisingly a lot of outlook work. You know, <laughs> responding to bosses, they want to make sure that you're that you're a busy worker, um, which which you inevitably will be. But but those are probably the things that you know describe you know what you do in banking, at least on a junior perspective, Fair enough. Um, and what you do on a day to day. Fair enough. And, and just kind of uh, similar to that, can you walk us through what your day in the life would look like on, say, an average day? I know it can fluctuate a bit. But... Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when I wake up, it's usually a matter of getting up to speed with with uh, emails that are coming in. Yeah. Usually by the time I wake up, say, 8.30, 8 a.m., um, there's already kind of a, an inflow of, of emails from more senior employees kind mm -hmm. of getting things kick-started for the day. Um, and so I'll spend the first hour or so just catching up on emails, replying to things. Beyond that, until maybe like 5 p.m. during the regular way working hours, you'll often find yourself stuck in meetings. Um, you know, as an analyst, it's important to be able to attend these meetings and, and kind of think through the things that are most important, synthesize the things that are the key conversation points in those calls uh, to be able to, to send around to your team. It's always useful given how many things are going around for, for everybody on your deal team um, just because they're exposed to so many different deals that they also have a reference point for, for what's going on. And so you do find yourself taking a lot of notes during these calls and kind of getting getting everything aggregated from, a, from an admin perspective. I think once kind of the 3, 4 p.m. mark shifts, um, that's kind of when you when you start working on your deliverables for the day. It'll obviously depend a lot on where you are in your deal processes and um, you know what what you're looking at at the time. But you know, again, it's kind of getting into the, the PowerPoint, working on slides that you might need to put together for for a deadline that's coming up, or or working on Excel for for different types of analyses that you're looking at um, and need to put together for the PowerPoint, um, and kind of just keeping keeping up to speed with with requests that come in as they as they do because. Um, you know, with a job like this, it's a request can come in at any time. So you got to be attentive to, uh, to to Outlook. And and when it comes to the work hours, what, what would you say an average week uh, looks like? Yeah, I think I think on average, I would say probably 80 hours a week. Okay. I think there's a lot of variance. Like it, it I would, I'm, I'm a little skeptical to say that it's always like that. Right. If it's slower, you know, I've, I've seen it go down to like 65 hours. But at the same token, if, if it's a super busy period, let's say a couple deals are live, I've seen it get up to 100 plus hours. And so it really varies. I'd say like 80 is probably the median. Okay. Um, that includes weekends as well? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say typical day is probably like 9 to 1 or 2 a.m. Um, okay. Monday through Thursday. Friday, people typically like to get off a little bit earlier, just um, ahead of the weekend. So it'll be something from like nine to six or seven. Okay. Um, luckily at, at my current firm, we have Saturdays protected. So usually they're pretty good about that. But Sundays, you know, it, it's also one of those things where you always have some type of work for the most part. It could be a few hours, but but um, there's always something to do. Sometimes it, it could be a full day, but it, it really just depends again on, on uh, what's going on in your deals. Makes sense. Makes sense. And just moving on to something else here, for say a first year analyst or somebody that's really fresh out of school, um, what kind of a salary can they expect? Yeah, I mean, when we were going through recruitment, I think there was for a long time there was kind of a set expectation that your base salary was was eighty five that eighty five k. Since then, there's been a bit of a, a competitive process within banks to try <laughs> to increase salary as a way of differentiating themselves to to students. And so, you know, it's, it, it varies a little bit more uh, than it used to. I would say, I would, I would say the normal range for a first year could be like 100 to 115K uh, as a base salary. And then as a bonus, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100% of base, depending on both the type of 
bank that you're at, whether that's a, a boutique firm or, or more bulge bracket type institution, um, but also depending on the general economic conditions of, of the time. Okay. And, and lastly, just for somebody that's looking to break into this type of a role, maybe as a student or already a working professional, uh, what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, unfortunately, with, with the banking industry, recruitment happens so early in your college career right. that I, I often feel like, like students feel a pressure to know everything yeah. when they start recruiting and at such an early age. Um, I think the first and foremost thing is just to, to say that don't don't feel the need to 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 know everything or, or feel like you're you have everything under your belt. You know, I I came from a background where I didn't have experience in in this side of finance or, or finance in general. Um, I didn't know what investment banking was even entering into college, and I know for a fact there were students there who, by the time they were seniors in high school, were already prepping by taking internships and stuff. I hadn't had an internship to, to that point. Um, I only had my first serious internship as a, as a freshman and I didn't really consider investment banking until I was a sophomore. And so, you know, if you're, if you're in that position and, and I, I, I just would, would, you know, tell you that you don't need to feel the pressure that, you know, sometimes might come with, with, um, schools that, that often have a, a strong pipeline into banking. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's often that, that type of external pressure on you. And so I, I, would, I would just say, take it easy from, from that perspective and, and know that, you know, you have time to, to develop what you need to and to, to be prepared for the job, regardless of when you decide to make that decision. Um, another thing I, th I think broadly is, you know, know why you're getting into banking. I think it's, it's easy if you're in a, in a business school program, um, especially one that a lot of kids like to go into banking to, right. where you think that that's something that you want, but I, I would say make sure it's something that it's not just for, you know, for the compensation or for the reputation, because the reality of the job is that it, it is a very demanding job. And it's those times when, um, you know, you're working a hundred hours a week when you start to question, you know, the the day to day things that you do, yeah. that it really it becomes apparent to you who's who's actually there for for having an interest in, in finance and in banking, and and who is not. Yeah. Um, and this will happen to everyone, but it it's one of those things where you want to be sure that the decision you're making is one that really aligns to your long term interests and and your goals. Um, and so th those are the things I'd probably keep most in mind when okay. going into a job like this. And kind of following that, so I suppose you've gotten the job, what, what kind of opportunities are you looking at maybe when you leave the job or, or maybe do most people stay there? What, what's that dynamic usually like? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, the great things about banking. It's just the flexibility it offers you uh, post, post the okay. job. You know, there is the opportunity to stay. I, I wouldn't say that the majority of people do that. Okay. Um, but when you leave banking, you, you have a lot of different opportunities in, in the finance area in general. So you'll see kids go to, to hedge funds, to private equity firms, to venture capital and growth equity. Um, some go into corporate development. If you want to go get your MBA, that's always an option as well. And it's something that you may be able to work with the firm that you're working at. Um, and so there's really a lot of avenues for how you can apply yourself beyond that. Right. Um, so I, I think it, from a fundamental skill set, it, it's a good segue into a lot of different careers. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Matthias, for doing this. I'm sure a lot of the audience will find it really insightful. If uh, you do have any doubts, feel free to comment them um, down below in the video. If you want to check out another interview with a Tesla financial analyst, check out this link down over here or this other link to check out the finance and valuation course that we mentioned earlier. Hit that like and that subscribe button if you liked it. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.